Okay, sir. For uh, uh, let me start from my side. Good evening, everybody. Welcome you all to today's webinar. As you all know that yeah. we are conducting every fortnight this webinar for mostly for the uh, postgraduate students. So uh, today we have a very interesting topic that is on localization of uh, strokes. So many times whenever we are sitting in OPD, we are getting a case of a stroke, whether acute or chronic. So you always start with your evaluation procedure with clinical exam examination and you correlate with your radiological findings. Uh, then you uh, may come to a conclusion, mm. maybe what is the type of stroke and uh, what is the expected outcome. So uh, mm -hmm. certainly I hope this, this topic is very much interesting. It will, uh, it will create more interest among the uh, juniors and the PG students. And it is uh, important as far as the clinical point of view, as well as the examination point of view. Most of the times questions you may get in the practical examination or viva examination regarding localization of stroke. So uh, without much wasting of time, uh, I would like to uh, introduce today's uh, chairperson of this uh, webinar, Professor Sunil Basu. He is the ex-professor and head of the department PMR. Uh, uh, Calcutta National Medical College. Presently, he is attached with Department of PMR, uh, KPC Medical College. And uh, today's speaker is Professor Asok Kumar Malik. He is the uh, Professor and Head of Neurology. He has drawn his DM Neurology from uh, Banaras Hindu University, Baranasi in 2000. And currently, he is serving as a Professor and Head of the Department Neurology. He is continuing his post since 2012. He has many national and international publications to his credit. He has received many awards for his outstanding achievements towards patient care and social responsibilities, as well as uh, academic excellency. Uh, recently, he has been appointed as a principal in investigator by ICMR for National Center for Disease Informatics and Research for the project uh, Hospital-Based Stroke Registry and a population-based stroke registry. So this is a unique work he's doing from uh, part of Eastern India. So I must congratulate him. And uh, without much wasting time, I invite Professor Basu to chair the session and uh, say a few words and formally inaugurate the webinar. Professor Basu, sir, please. Yes, sir. Good evening, everybody. Uh, people present on these dais. Uh, we have gathered discussed this stroke, location of this stroke, which is very important topics and very essential topics. Yes. And it will be delivered by the general giant figures of the neurology. And uh, uh, you, uh, all you know, the neurological emergency by the sudden onset of the neurological deficit of presumed vascular origin, which persists for Ill, at least one. According to some authorities, 20 minutes is a cut up between the stroke and the TIA. It is the second most common cause of death and third most common cause of disability worldwide. Prognosis of the stroke depends on the age and patient. Everything will be uh, delivered by this our Dr. Malik and we'll uh, de describe you everything uh, uh, emergency, the treatment and early diagnosis, everything will help us and we will all uh, think that he will some, uh, throw the, some highlights over this uh, over the uh, over, over this one and uh, the mechanical thrombolysis development and management of the ischemic stroke with the thrombolysis and the mechanical thrombo thrombectomy is always related to early diagnosis and localization. So thank you and we hope you will learn something some wind and slam, some new thing from our Dr. Malik and 
why i will not waste your time to please please dr mullik to start and to give us some new uh, new knowledge new achievements of this see thank you. thank you sir thank you chair person uh, so uh, pavitra uh, my slides are visible yes sir your slides are visible thank you chair persons and uh, thank you pavitra for inviting me to give a talk uh, about the localization of talk i will not uh, cover uh, the treatment uh, modalities because yes, uh, there is a vast subject so anybody interested for treatment can ask uh, by uh, question also treatment regarding thrombotic stroke thrombotic stroke or hemorrhagic stroke or embolic stroke so that is not included in the topic but anybody is interested to know about thrombolysis or something mechanical thrombectomy they, they can ask by questions also so sure, sir. as told by professor basu so the definition of stroke it, it is a sudden onset uh, neurological deficit due to vascular causes so vascular uh, means uh, that is the blood, blood vessel supplying the uh, brain so that is a stroke or cerebrovascular accident is defined as an abrupt onset of a neurologic deficit that is attributable to the focal vascular cause and the clinical manifestations of stroke are highly variable because of the complex anatomy of the brain and its vasculation and a careful history and neurologic ekal examination can often localize the region of brain dysfunction because localization of brain uh, stroke is very important for diagnosis and further management uh, by the rehabilitation people and uh, also uh, then the stroke again is classified uh, as th hemorrhagic stroke thrombotic stroke and hemorrhagic stroke and thrombotic stroke thrombotic stroke again is classified as atherothrombotic stroke and thromboembolic stroke so intracerebral hematoma and thrombosis and the uh, age of onset the uh, these are the some of the risk factors which are non modifiable and modifiable so age gender race family history genetics are the non modifiable risk factors and some of the modifiable risk factors are arterial hypertension transient ischemic attacks prior stroke asymptomatic carotid bruch stenosis carotid disease aortic arch atherosclerosis diabetes mellitus dyslipidemia cigarette smoking alcohol consumption which are which can be modified and uh, to know about or localizing the stroke so you should know something about the blood supply of the brain i'm like you know film me like you know so now coming to the blood supply of the brain the brain receives its blood supply from the vertebral and internal carotid artery and in general branches derived from the vertebral artery supply the caudal half of the brain including the brain stem mid brain occipital lobes inferior portion of the temporal lobes and most of the thalamus while branches of the internal carotid artery supply the basal ganglia frontal and parietal lobes and the lateral portion of the temporal lobes and most of the internal capsule and the anterior cerebral artery supply the anteromedial portion of the cerebrum the middle cerebral artery are situated laterally supplying the majority of the lateral part of the brain and the posterior cerebral artery supply both the medial and lateral parts of the posterior cerebrum and these are the sum of the vascular territory so gold uh, color anterior cerebral artery and pink is middle cerebral artery and the posterior cerebral artery is um, indicated by blue and the terminal branches of the vertebral and internal carotid artery all anastomose to form a circle circular blood vessel mm -hmm. called the arterial circle of willis there are three main constituents of the circle of willis that is the anterior cerebral artery internal carotid arteries posterior cerebral arteries and anterior communicating artery and posterior communicating artery so this is yes. the uh, diagram of the circle of willis so uh, so these are the middle cerebral artery this is the posterior communicating artery this is the anterior communicating artery as anterior communicating artery and this is the these are the anterior cerebral artery so mainly middle cerebral anterior cerebral anterior communicating as well as posterior communicating this is the basilar artery and dividing into superior cerebellar artery these are the small pontine branches and these two large are the posterior cerebral artery mainly supplying the occipital cortex so this is the main arterial 
circle of oil is which is supplying uh, the brain mainly different parts of the brain and this is the cerebral hemisphere in coronal section showing the territories of the major cerebral vessel so this is this area is supplied by the internal capsule this is the claustrum and this is the lenticular striate arteries so and this is the lateral uh, cerebral hemisphere lateral aspect showing the branches of the distribution of the middle cerebral artery and the principal region of the cerebral localization so this uh, these uh, so these uh, colors indicate this is the broca's area motor area sensory cortex auditory area and motor cortex so this is the motor cortex this is the sensory area this is the auditory area this is the broca's area and this is the medial surface or cerebral uh, hemisphere showing the branches and distribution of the anterior cerebral artery and the principal regions of the cerebral localization and this is the inferior aspect of the brain with branches and distribution of the posterior cerebral artery these are the different branches and this is the posterior circulation so these are the posterior cerebral artery and deep branches of the basilar artery this is the anterior inferior cerebellar artery and this is the basilar artery vertebral artery and posterior inferior cerebellar artery so based on symptoms so now localization so localization localization wise the brain can so we can localize uh, from different aspects of different types of stroke suppose the patient is having a hemorrhagic stroke so hemorrhagic stroke means there is a rupture of blood vessels so what happens the middle cerebral artery is the commonest blood vessel which ruptures the lenticular striate branches of the middle cerebral artery are perforating branches which are the most vulnerable for rupture and the putamen and globus pallidus are the commonest site of intracerebral hematoma why because due to chronic hypertension or untreated hypertension what happens in the tunica intima of the blood vessels there occurs lipohyaluronic changes and amyloid angiopathy and this amyloid angiopathy that causes very small small aneurysms that is the that is known as charcot vuchard aneurysm and during stressful activity this charcot vuchard aneurysm rupture and causes intracerebral hematoma that is why the perforating branches of the middle cerebral artery are the commonest uh, blood vessel which rupture and putamen and globus pallidus is the commonest blood vessel which rupture and blood uh, when there occurs a blood clot or hematoma in the internal capsules or basal ganglia so there occurs contralateral hemiplegia and there occurs all facial nerve or facial involvement that is upper motor neuron type because the facial uh, nerve nucleus is situated in the pons so anything above the pons that gives rise to upper motor neuron symptoms or pyramidal tract involvement so uh, basically uh, if you start the uh, pathway of the pyramidal tract the pyramidal tract starts from the area 4 and 6 and the motor cortex then it comes to the internal capsule via corona radiata then from the internal capsule it comes to the midbrain and pons and in the lower part of the medulla more than 85% fibers crosses to the opposite side as lateral corticospinal tract and about 15% fibers descend downwards as ventral corticospinal tract and starting from the area 4 and 6 and the motor cortex the pyramidal fibers end at the level of in, um, 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 anterior horn cell of the spinal cord the pyramidal cortex starts from pyramid starting from the pyramidal cortex to the anterior horn cell that is known as the upper motor neuron and from the anterior horn cell downwards to the muscle it is the lower motor neuron so in hemiplegia the, there occurs involvement of the upper motor neuron fibers or pyramidal fibers along with the cranial nerve nucleus also the cranial nerve nucleus also starts from the area 4 and 6 and motor cortex to the cranial nerve nucleus that is known as the upper motor neuron fibers or cortico bulbar fibers that is why in any patients of hemiplegia the upper motor neuron facial pseudo bulbar involvement bulbar involvement is very common so classical hemiplegia when you call it a classical hemiplegia when there occurs contralateral hemiplegia along with the contralateral facial upper motor neuron so that is the classical hemiplegia usually the teaching is the lesion is in the side of internal capsule and if suppose a there occurs a facial nerve lower motor neuron at the pons and the contralateral hemiplegia that is known as the 
um, crossed hemiplegia. So the site of lesion is in the pons. So that is why anything in the internal capsule, vessel ganglia that causes a uh, hemorrhage or in usually you describe hemorrhage in terms of the structures and the infarct or thrombosis as arterial territory. That is why anything basal ganglia hemat hematoma may occur at any site. Suppose there is a lobar hematoma, any lobe like parietal lobe, occipital lobe, temporal lobe, frontal lobe, hematoma may occur. So lobar hematoma does not give rise to usually hemiparesis. So it causes hemiparesis and <clears throat> sometimes the lobar hematoma due to pressure effect, most hematoma they uh, present like features of raised intracranial tensions like headache, vomiting, convulsion, bilateral papilledoma. So, lobar hematoma. Suppose a patient develop a cerebellar hematoma. Suppose the patient uh, uh, having a hematoma in the left cerebellar hemisphere. So, that gives ipsilateral symptoms because cerebellar has ipsilateral supply. So, patient will have features of incoordination like finger nose incoordination, titubation, nystagmus, kneel test positive, dysdiatokinesia, ataxia, swing to athlete. So, cerebellar hematoma, uh, you can diagnose by if the patient having hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia presents with sudden onset in coordination, vertigo, vomiting, dizziness, then you suspect always the patient is having a cerebellar hematoma. Suppose so a patient having uh, developed a sudden onset unilateral sensory symptoms like tingling, numbness, burning associated sir, with... Sir, your slides are not running. No, no, actually, okay, okay. So these are not in the slides. Oh, okay. Okay, okay. Ah. Fine. We can continue. Ah, so... Suppose a patient having sudden onset tingling, numbness, bonding sensation in one half of the body and with a history of hypertension, diabetes, hyperlipidemia, smoking. So always suspect thalamic lesion because thalamus is the sensory relay station. So unilateral involvement of the upper limb, lower limb as well as this. So, so always uh, suspect a thalamic lesion. So the localization is thalamus, sensory symptoms mainly. And cerebellar incoordination. Suppose a patient developed basal ganglia hematoma or infarct, hemi contralateral classical hemiplegia. Then suppose a lobar hematoma or infarct, patient developed with features of raised intracranial tension, hemiplegia you may or may not get. So thalamic hematoma usually sensory symptoms along with hemiparesis because the thalamus lies very close to the internal capsule. So that is why any thalamic hematoma in fact that gives edema and compression over the internal capsule. Hematoma diagnosis and uh, localization is very easy. Suppose the patient is having a pontine lesion. So 4P pontine hyperpyrexia, patient will have hyperpyrexia, pinpoint people. So these are the symptoms. Uh, suppose the midbrain and uh, uh, midbrain hematoma. So midbrain is a very uh, compact structure. The pyramidal fibers are very compactly arranged in midbrain. So patient may have quadriparesis and other cranial nerve involvement because the forebrain contains cranial nerve 1 and 2, midbrain uh, 3 and 4, then pons 5, 6, 7, 8 cranial nerves and medulla is 9, 10, 11, 12. Accordingly, you will get also cranial nerve symptoms. So medulla, because the, all the vital centers are situated in the medulla, you will get along with cranial nerves, patient may have hemiplegia, may have quadriplegia or quadriparesis. Then the patient will die um, um, and prognosis is very pure um, 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 because all the vital centers are situated in medulla like cardiac center, respiratory respiratory centers and patient will be comatose due to activation of the uh, reticular activating system. So accordingly by you can also localize the lesions, but the main lesion, the main difficulty lies if the patient is having arterial territory in far. So, so cortical lesion, focal seizure, aphasia does not produce hemiplegia. Patient may have hemiparesis and uh, you may have cortical type of sensory loss like graphesthesia, two-point discrimination. These are the cortical type of sensory loss. Then uh, if you come to the corona radiata, one limb more involved than the other, then you will have cortical sensory loss and no cortical, you may not have any cortical signs. And internal capsule, dense hemiplegia, because internal capsule, the pyramidal fibers are densely placed, so 
when the internal capsule anterior limb genu and posterior limb will be involved you may have dense hemiplegia and patient may have visual disturbance like homonymous hemianopia and hemianesthesia so thalamus contralateral hemisensory loss with agonizing or burning pain that is the jerin rauch syndrome then brain stem mid brain weber syndrome ipsilateral third cranial nerve palsy with contralateral hemiplegia mid brain and clod syndrome that is ipsilateral third nerve palsy with contralateral ataxia then pons pin point people gaze palsy because the gaze centers or medial longitudinal fasciculus or are uh, between the third fourth sixth cranial nerve so gaze palsy either either you may have horizontal gaze palsy or vertical gaze palsy then dull side uh, reflex will be diminished or absent if the brain stem uh, will be involved and hemiplegia then cranial nerve 6 7 8 accordingly and stroke within the anterior then coming to the stroke within the anterior circulation that is the middle cerebral artery anterior cerebral artery anterior choroidal artery internal carotid artery and common carotid artery. these are the strokes within the anterior circulation so there is a this is the cross section of the brain mri cross section of the brain at the level of the basal ganglia so so this is the head of cardiac nucleus so this is thalamus and this is the internal capsule anterior limb genu posterior limb this is the anterior limb this is the genu this is the posterior limb this is area is thalamus this is the head of cardiac nucleus and these are the uh, uh, putamen and uh, globus pallidus that is the lentiform nucleus and this is the external capsule and the, subsequently this is the cerebral cortex so this area is supplied by the uh, pca territory and this also is supplied by the pca territory then head of the cardiac nucleus anterior cerebral artery deep branches and mca territory and uh, <coughs> these are the arterial some of the arterial supplies at the cross section of the basal ganglia and coming to the uh, middle cerebral artery it is the largest branch of the internal carotid runs in lateral cerebral sulcus so this is the lateral cerebral sulcus middle cerebral artery supplying uh, the medial uh, surface of the brain and it cortical branches supply the entire lateral and orbital surface of the cortex except one inch of the lateral supplied by the anterior cerebral artery this area is supplied by the anterior cerebral artery and occipital pole and interlateral surface of the hemisphere supplied by posterior cerebral artery the supply all except the leg area it is supplied by the middle cerebral artery and this is the middle cerebral artery supply then uh, coming to the occlusion how the occlusion so thrombotic uh, what happens when there occurs a thrombus it occludes uh, different parts of the cerebral artery like anterior cerebral artery middle cerebral artery posterior cerebral artery which areas are mostly involved in thrombus so they are involved there is no definite cause but but the middle cerebral artery are most commonly involved in st stroke and uh, what happens in stem occlusion so there occurs contralateral hemiplegia contralateral hemianesthesia homonymous hemianopia conjugate gaze palsy and dysarthria due to facial weakness so mainly dysarthria when a stroke patient develop dysarthria that may be due to facial nerve involvement facial paralysis or bulbar involvement so otherwise the patients of aphasia have different types of uh, problems so dysarthria patients usually always have some facial nerve involvement bulbar or surobulbar involvement bulbar or surobulbar involvement may be due to involvement of the 9th and 10th cranial nerve surobulbar is upper motor neuron bulbar is lower motor neuron and if the dominant hemisphere so in most of the um, persons having dominant in the left side of the brain dominant hemisphere the patient developed global aphasia that is both motor and sensory aphasia and non dominant that is the, the patient will have contraapraxia and distal branches weakness of the hand weakness of hand and arm facial weakness is bocage aphasia if the superior division of the middle cerebral artery is involved then motor and sensory and bocage aphasia frontal and superior parietal cortex will be involved and if the inferior division is involved patient developed wernicke's aphasia that is the sensory aphasia inferior parietal and temporal cortex that is supplies the middle cerebral artery so <clears throat> this is the thromboembolic lesion of the right middle cerebral artery so this is the lesion of the right hemisphere i deviation towards the site of the lesion and the symptoms of signs conjugate i deviation left sided hemiplegia and the patient may have sometimes unconsciousness or coma or uh, um, semi conscious
so this is the mri picture of a infarct so this is a infarct in the left side middle cerebral artery territory this is the middle cerebral artery territory there is a infarct then coming uh, something about aphasia so broca's aphasia that is a broca's aphasia uh, means motor aphasia so that is a non fluent expressive motor anterior uh, peri uh, pre rolandic executive aphasia the most common etiology is infarct in the territory of the left middle cerebral artery that is the dominant hemisphere superior division and patients have labored on uh, uh, inflated non fluent spontaneous speech with a decrease amount of linguistic output few words short sentences and poor grammar it is due to lesion involving the anterior perisylvian speech areas in the posterior infer uh, frontal region then uh, so uh, coming to arnicke's aphasia the most common etiology is infarct in the left mca inferior division territory patients are unable to understand speech that is the comprehension that is known as comprehension is very poor patient will not what you are telling patient will not able to receive so patient are unable to understand speech word deafness or read word blindness so arnicke's aphasia is due to lesion in the posterior superior temporal region that involves the auditory association cortex and the angular and supra marginal gyri they are relatively fluent with normal or even increased word output so um, if the patient developed global global aphasia neither the patient will comprehend or receive anything nor the patient will tell anything so that is the global aphasia so global aphasia this is due to lesion in most of the territory of the left middle cerebral artery left side dominant hemisphere the lesion of the patient is global aphasia are usually large involving both the inferior frontal and superior temporal lesions and often much of the parietal lobe in between global aphasia is usually due to internal carotid or proximal mc occlusion and total expressive receptive complete aphasia this is the total aphasia so <clears throat> so now coming uh, some of the non dominant hemisphere involvement in stroke due to infarct so this is some uh, very interesting is the jorsman syndrome that is the combination of acalculia impairment of simple arithmetic and dysgraphia impaired writing finger anomia and uh, inability to name individual fingers such as the index and uh, thumb and dysgraphia and right to left confusion and right to left disorientation patient will not inability to tell whether a hand foot or arm of the patient or examiner is on the right or the left side of the body so that is known as a jorsman syndrome when jorsman syndrome is arises acutely or in isolation it is commonly associated with the damage to the inferior parietal lobule especially the angular gyrus in the left hemisphere jorsman syndrome this is the diagnosis jorsman syndrome this is the infarct then coming to the anterior cerebral artery it is less common stroke feeds the inferior part deep brain structures frontal and parietal lobes corpus callosum and bottom of the cerebrum so weakness and sensory loss contralateral leg mainly leg area is involved and it is clumsy slow and initiate response apathy mute frontal lobe lesion sir apathy patient will have apathy mute short term memory loss impulsivity lack of concentration incontinence so and uh, <clears throat> some of the frontal lobe signs may be incontinence of the urine you may get patient have uh, executive um, dysfunction in the executive behavior then anterior cerebral artery a1 and a2 division is a1 and a2 so uh a1 when a1 occlusion occurs no loss due to collateral through the anterior because most of the anterior part is supplied by the collateral through anterior communicating communicating artery that is why a1 uh, occlusion does not cause any neurological deficit and a2 occlusion paralysis of the contralateral leg less degree paresis contralateral arm so leg area is affected more than the arm and cortical type of sensory loss of the lower limb and patient will have urinary incontinence so that is sometimes known as social incontinence if the frontal lobe is involved and uninhibited bladder so this is the front aca infarct then and uh, coming to the anterior choroidal artery infarct arises from internal carotid artery it is supplies the posterior limb of the internal capsule occlusion and contralateral hemiplegia hemianesthesia and homonymous hemianopia then stroke within posterior circulation 
so that is mainly supplied by the posterior cerebral artery that is loss of vision mainly loss of vision in the that is the cortical type of blindness so patient or pupillary react, reaction will be normal that is not due to pupillary involvement so cortical involvement so 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 to differentiate between the cortical blindness and blindness due to optic nerve if you examine the pupillary reaction the pupillary reaction will be dilated pupil will be dilated in optic nerve involvement a reaction will be sluggish and in cortical involvement patient will be blind but the pupil reaction will be normal so that is a stroke within posterior circulation posterior cerebral artery these are the posterior cerebral artery vertebral and posterior inferior cerebellar artery then basilar artery so posterior cerebral artery 5 to 10% of the stroke so <clears throat> Uh, then P1 syndrome, posterior cerebral P1 syndrome that uh, causes contralateral hemiplegia and third nerve involvement. That is the Weber syndrome and contralateral ataxia plus third nerve palsy. That is Claude syndrome and contralateral hemisensory loss followed by agonizing pain in the affected area. That is the thalamic gerin lausi syndrome and P2 syndrome is contralateral homonymous hemianopia with macular sparing. This is the posterior circulation stroke or posterior circulation infarct in the occipital lobe, mainly occipital lobe, PCA infarct. Then uh, what is Anton syndrome? That is a very interesting syndrome that is called uh, visual anosognosia or denial of loss of vision. The patient will tell that uh, <clears throat> I will not um, uh, complain of loss of vision, which is associated with confabulation in the setting of obvious visual loss and cortical blindness is known as Anton syndrome. So bilateral occipital lobe damage. So this is the bilateral infarct. This is a CT scan. This is the plane axial section of the plane CT scan. This is the midbrain, and these are the occipital lobe. So there is a bilateral. See, this is the tentorium cerebelli. This white is the tentorium. This is the fax cerebelli, and this is bilateral occipital infarct. So hypotense. Bilateral occipital hypotense means infarct. The Hounsfield unit must be between plus 25 to plus 35. So to differentiate between uh, infarct and uh, CSF, some Sometimes causes uh, some problem, but the if you ask the CT scan people, that is the attenuation value. The infarct will be plus 25 to plus 35, and CSF and any uh, fluid or liquid will be minus. So this is the occipital lobe infarct bilateral. Then coming to the most interesting medial and lateral medullary syndrome. So these are the supply. This is the supply of the so. Um, uh, medial and lateral medullary syndrome. The clinical features of the lateral medullary syndromes are mainly it is involvement of the posterior inferior cerebellar artery that is known as lateral medullary syndrome or Wallenberg syndrome. And medial medullary syndrome, this is the anti involvement of the anterior spinal artery. So the causes of in, so the clinical symptoms clinical features will be involvement of the inferior cerebellar pedicle that causes ipsilateral limb ataxia same side limb ataxia involvement of the vestibular nuclei causes vertigo nausea vomiting nystagmus so nucleus ambiguous that is the cranial nerve 9th 10th and 11th that causes ipsilateral paralysis of the larynx, pharynx, palate, and dysarthria, dysphagia, loss of gag reflex, and that sometimes causes hoarseness of voice. And spinal tract of the trigeminal nerve, that causes ipsilateral pain and temperature loss in the face. So trigeminal. Then spinothalamic tract involvement, that is contralateral pain, temperature loss, body. And descending hypothalamic ipsilateral Horner syndrome. So patient will have ipsilateral Horner syndrome, ipsilateral limb ataxia, and vestibular nucleus involvement causes nausea, vomiting, and nystagmus. Then involvement of the nucleus ambiguous causes ipsilateral paralysis of the larynx or bulbar involvement. And spinal tract of the trigeminal nerve, that causes ipsilateral pain, temperature loss, of the face and spinothalamic contralateral temperature and pain loss that is the uh, spinothalamic involvement so very common lateral medullary syndrome you will find in clinical settings very common lateral medullary syndrome and medial medial medullary syndrome causes pyramid involvement of the pyramid that is contralateral spastic paraparesis pyramidal tract and medial lemniscus that causes contralateral loss of tactile vibration and conscious proprioception and uh, that is the 12th nerve nucleus causes ipsilateral flaccid paralysis of the tongue. So unilateral flaccid paralysis tongue will be atrophied 
tongue will be deviated towards the site of the lesion. So tongue involvement, median lemniscus involvement and pyramidal tract involvement. That is the medial medullary syndrome. So this is the vertebral uh, and uh, pica and posterior inferior cerebellar artery that causes lateral medullary syndrome. That is Wellenberg syndrome. These are the different areas that they, uh, that is different parts of the brain involved. So spinal tract of the trigeminal nucleus, fifth nerve nucleus, nucleus ambiguous, spinothalamic tract, vestibular nucleus, then uh, nucleus solitarius. Uh, um, as already told, lateral uh, symptoms and signs of um, lateral medullary as well as medial uh, medullary syndrome. Then coming to the basilar artery, it is supply base of the pons and superior cerebellum and fall into three groups, paramedian group, short circumferential group, and superior cerebellar and anterior inferior cerebellar uh, arteries. So basilar artery syndrome, what is, uh, what is basilar artery syndrome? That is due to complete occlusion of the basilar artery by atheromatous plex or thrombus. So bilateral long tract signs, sensory and motor, signs of cranial nerve and cerebellar dysfunction, basilar artery. And occlusion of a branch that causes unilateral motor and sensory signs and cranial nerves. So if there occurs complete occlusion, you will find bilateral findings. And if there is a occlusion of a branch of the basilar artery, you will find unilateral findings. Then <clears throat> some of the there is some of the uh, uh, pontine syndromes that causes superior pontine that is the medial superior pontine syndrome or paramedian branches of the upper basilar artery. So one side of lesion you will get cerebellar ataxia, internuclear ophthalmoplegia, myoclonic syndromes, palate, pharynx, vocal cords, respiratory apparatus, face, oculomotor apparatus. One side opposite the lesion will be, have, have paralysis of face, arm and leg. Rarely touch, vibration and position are affected. And lateral superior pontine syndromes on the side of the lesion, ataxia, limb, and gait. So very difficult to remember these things. But accordingly, if you remember the structure of the brain, then you can localize. Then mid pontine syndromes. Then, <clears throat> then coming to the summary of the involvement of the different arterial territory. So vascular territory, mainly internal uh, carotid artery territory. There will be hemiparesis, aphasia, and hemianopia. And anterior cerebral artery hemiparesis, especially the uh, lower limbs. Middle cerebral artery, upper limb hemiparesis, hemianopia, and aphasia, if the dominant hemisphere is involved. And posterior cerebral artery hemiparesis, sometimes you will have hemiparesis, hemi visual loss, hemianopia, uh, ataxia due to involvement of the cerebellum and vermis, and dizziness, vertigo, sorry. Uh, then basilar artery breathing difficulties, sensory or balance disorders, ataxia, nystagmus, opisthotonus, uh, tremor and vomiting. Then cerebellar artery sensory difficulties mainly headache, fever, coordination difficulties and uh, uh, then uh, there is some of the basic difference, how to differentiate between the thrombotic, embolic and hemorrhagic strokes. So age of onset is middle or old age thrombotic, embolic young age, middle or old age hemorrhagic, onset and progression less rapid, stepwise, because you see if uh, when a patient comes with a history of TIA or transient ischemic attack and the transient ischemic attack that is the focal sudden onset neurological deficit that clears within 24 hours. So if the patient will have uh, different TIA symptoms without treatment, develop strokes, uh, the most commonly the patient will have thrombotic or ischemic stroke. And uh, stroke in evolution, suppose the patient develops a stroke uh, dysarthria in the morning, you don't treat. Then left-sided uh, upper limb weakness in the evening and the next day the patient will have complete hemiplegia. So that is stroke in evolution. So onset and progression less rapid stepwise and embolic stroke is sudden onset in second. Suppose a embolic, cardiac embolism, mitral stenosis, mitral valve stenosis, chronic rheumatic heart disease, arterial fibrillation, developed stroke. 
so that is sudden onset and rapidly progressive catastrophic is hemorrhagic stroke because hemorrhage most of the hemorrhagic strokes patients develop e a um, um, red intra uh, red uh, intracranial tension and sometimes brain herniation so features of raised icd headache vomiting convulsion as well as coma so that is most probably a hemorrhagic stroke and during activity during stressful activity the patient develop hemorrhagic stroke then time of onset in sleep and after waking any time embolic stroke during activity vomiting absent occasional absent and recurrent vomiting due to features of raised intracranial tension and patient developed um, involvement of the chemo receptor trigger zone so that causes vomiting and headache milder absent milder absent prominent headache you will get in hemorrhagic stroke early resolution variable possible and unusual meningeal irritation absent absent may be present when the patient developed subarachnoid hemorrhage because subarach you have to hemorrhagic stroke also subarachnoid hemorrhage you have to diagnose sometimes subarachnoid hemorrhage is due to rupture of the berry or sacular aneurysm these are the large aneurysms you will find sudden onset excruciating headache that that is the first time headache in his life with or without any neurological signs but the patient will have features of meningeal irritation like neck stiffness kerning sign as brusniski sign patient will have severe headache so if you do the ct scan there will be blood in the subarachnoid cysts like supracellular cyst prepontine cyst perimesian cephalic cyst sylvian cyst as well as subarachnoid space and you, if you do the csf there will be csf will be uniformly hemorrhagic and subsequently you diagnose by doing the ct angio or mr angio to find the aneurysm and the treatment is surgery always you to do the digital subtraction angiogram and you uh, either now it is the surgeons are doing either aneurysm clipping or um, coiling so subarachnoid hemorrhage uh, patient uh, meningeal irritation signs of meningeal irritation you will find then blood pressure high pmb cardiac stroke normal and usually high in blood pressure in high Uh, in both thrombotic and uh, hemorrhagic stroke so these are some of the differences between um, the clinical diagnosis of thrombotic embolic and hemorrhagic stroke so features clinical feature thrombotic stroke you will find sometimes high supportive uh, carotid bruit carotid we will put a stethoscope you will find carotid bruit embolic possible and hemorrhagic not seen then ct scan pale in fact pale in fact hemorrhage csf usually normal normal blood stains increased pressure in subarachnoid hemorrhage so this is the classical low bar hemorrhage it is not low bar exactly low bar hemorrhage so there is a hemorrhage in the left uh, uh, cut cortical parieto occipital parietal lobe as well as uh, occipital lobe and this black area is surrounded by this is the edema component so this is the blood you see this is the calcification this is the blood so this uh, uh, attenuation value of blood is plus 50 to plus 70 calcification is more than 100 this is the pineal body um, uh, calcification so this is the frontal horn of the lateral ventricle these are the occipital horn of the lateral ventricles so there is gross edema so this is the classical basal ganglia hematoma on the right side so this is the internal capsule this is the this is anterior limb genu posterior this is the classical basal ganglia hematoma so this is the pontine hematoma this is the posterior fossa so these are the cerebellar hemispheres this is the vermis and this is the pons so uh hematoma uh, uh, localization is uh, not difficult uh, by history if you have the features of raised intracranial tension headache vomiting and during activity so that must be a, a hematoma and hematoma patient you can diagnose if the ct scan shows hematoma and accordingly cerebellar hematoma brain stem hematoma mid brain hematoma lobar hematoma um, cerebellar hematoma you can diagnose and suppose there is a large infarct also so you can diagnose but uh, difficulties arises uh, when you diagnose a, in a particular arterial territory like middle cerebral artery territory anterior cere uh, cerebral artery territory posterior cerebral uh, artery territory then lateral medullary syndrome which is a very common 
uh, and um, uh, when the patient developed some uh, unusual features like anton syndrome and some apraxic syndromes non dominant hemisphere constrictional apraxia then aphasia global usually uh, the hemiplegia with large infarctor hemorrhage right sided hemiplegia have some global aphasia both motor and sensory aphasia so the patient having a temporal lobe lesion sometimes memory loss occurs and chronic if the patient will have chronic infarcts multiple small infarct with the history of diabetes hypertension so they developed cognitive impairment or vascular dementia sometimes after so many days the patient will develop memory loss you do the ct scan of the brain or mri the brain there will be a multiple small 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 lacunar in fact so uh, but uh, uh, stroke local localization if you know the definite arterial territory it will be some easier but um, Uh, after doing the MRI scan or CT scan is not uh, for an infarct. CT scan is the best diagnostic purpose of stroke, and that is for hemorrhagic stroke. But for small infarct, lacunar infarct, or silent infarct, so MRI is the most uh, um, uh, probable diagnostic uh, procedure by which you can uh, diagnose. Because the diagnosis is very important in uh, thrombotic stroke. If the golden period, the patient presents within the golden period, that is the four and half hours. That is the golden or window period. So ischemic core and penumbra are there. So to salvage the ischemic penumbra, the golden period is very important because within that period, if you do the thrombolytic therapy by recombinant tissue plasminogen active activator, the patient's life will be saved and the disability will be less. So localization is very important, and uh, this is stroke is a very vast chapter. So Dr. Pavitra has. Uh, Uh, told me to tell about the localization um, uh, we'll uh, discuss the um, uh, therapeutic uh, approach uh, in some other classes uh, so uh, i think uh, my topic is uh, over now so thank you for your patience uh, hearing thank you sir pavitra you can take uh, sir thank you very much sir for your extensive talk on localization of strokes so uh, of course it's a Uh, the slides are running very fast way i don't know how far our students are following those slides or not anyway it's very interesting talk uh, still we mm, need no, to no. learn a, a lot to learn about this uh, localization uh, before coming to the let me take some questions from the ah, okay, okay. Uh, participants uh, one question is on uh, what is the cause of loss of consciousness in mca sir mca circulation stroke is loss of consciousness a common feature of a posterior circulation or mca ha nahi ji loss of consciousness is very common in posterior circulation stroke due to uh, involvement of the reticular activating system but in uh, mca stroke if the patient develop them the features of um, uh, herniation then at that time the patient uh, uh, so suppose there is a large infarct so causing uh, massive uh, mass effect or malignant uh, infarct and causing some convulsion cortical involvement at that time patient may have loss of consciousness uh, but coma usually occurs in uh, brain stem uh, involvement that is posterior circulation so far no more question sir do you have an experience of a, of a, a stroke with spinal cord injury uh, i was learning from one topic that uh, spinal, hemiplegia can occurs uh, in spinal cord injury above c4 level what spinal, is your opinion uh, and experience spinal cord injury no 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 which a posterior circulation the anterior spinal artery that causes the medial medullary syndrome Uh, I have the, um, uh, given one slide. The medial medullary syndrome uh, may be due to involvement of the anterior spinal artery, anterior spinal artery. So that I think uh, if there occurs injury to the spinal cord, there may be involvement of the anterior spinal artery and cause medial medullary syndrome. That is the cause of maybe the cause of stroke. Otherwise, uh, there is no definite uh, uh, relationship between uh, spinal injury and stroke. Uh, if uh, anything, you know, you can enlighten us. <laughs> Yes, sir. So far, there is no more questions from the chat box. I was expecting lot questions, a lot of questions from the audience, but uh, so far there is no question from uh, chat box. Let me see once again. Uh, Professor Sunil Basu sir, uh, do you have any comments on this uh, presentation, sir? 
or you want to add anything to this it is very excellent uh, lecture and we have earned some learning some sides of this uh, involvement due to the some side stuff i am very very happy thank you sir so if there is no more question in the chat box then probably we will have to uh, wind up the session uh, on behalf of association of physical medicine rehabilitation and department of pmr has been retired indian association of physical medicine rehabilitation i thank uh, dr ashok kumar malik sir uh, he has accepted my invest invitation in uh, single <laughs> request So thank you very much, sir. You spent your valuable time for enlightening us regarding stroke. I hope uh, some more lectures from your side, from your department, okay. on okay. other aspect of stroke okay. and other part of the neurological aspect disease, which uh, in which the PMR specialists are related. So I expect some cooperation from your side, sir. Thank you very much for joining and enlightening us. And uh, I must thank uh, Dr. Sunil Kumar Basu, sir. Uh, for giving his consent for chairing the session i thank all participants who have joined this webinar through zoom or through youtube mode also uh, my special thanks to uh, all the office bearers of uh, association of physical medicine rehabilitation and indian association of physical medicine rehabilitation as well as the pr team of uh, iapmr Uh, i must thank all my uh, juniors of my department all pg students who, those who are supporting this webinar and uh, uh, last not uh, the least but not the least i must thank the pr team who is greatly supporting us for conducting this webinar uh, before leaving this sir uh, there are <laughs> now two two questions come up can, yeah, okay, can okay, we take no those two questions ha ah, ah, ha ah, okay no problem ha ah. okay so can you please comment on autonomic autonomic symptoms associated with uh, stroke uh, autonomic uh, symptoms associated with stroke stroke no basically autonomic symptoms uh specifically not described in any type of vascular territorial stroke because the um, autonomic uh, are cranio sacral or thoraco lumbar so autonomic symptoms are mainly due to uh, some of the uh, auto immune disorders and peripheral nerve involvement but uh, we usually don't uh, find any autonomic generally autonomic symptoms and signs so so patient may have tachycardia bradycardia hypotension hypotension uh, increased sweating um, bladder um, involvement so postural hypotension so suppose the stroke patient patient may have some postural hypotension due to drug but the, that may be not be due to postural hypotension means if the blood pressure falls 30 by 15 or 20 by 10 when the patient be, become symptomatic so that may not be due to stroke sometimes we are uh, having patients of stroke complaining of uh, while getting up from squatting position patients are having features of syncopal attack like uh, vertigo vomiting dizziness blackout sweating so these are the some of the autonomic symptoms and when we measure the blood pressure we will find there is uh, some uh, postural drop so i think that may be uh, not be due to involvement of uh, due to stroke involvement so that may be due to some drug like anti hypertensive drugs so uh, definitely i had not come across any autonomic symptoms uh, uh, related to stroke patients maybe the question is regarding that if the uh cranial nerves and involve involve those nerves which are associated with the so most features. most most commonly the cranial nerve involvement are supranuclear cortico bulbar involvement mm -hmm. so cortico bulbar involvement does not cause any autonomic symptoms or signs because it is a upper motor neuro stroke is a upper motor neuron disorder most common all the cranial nerves may be involved which are above pons all the cranial nerve 
because the facial nerve nucleus lies in the pons so above pons all the upper motor neuron cranial nerves may be involved because the other uh, pyramid along with the pyramidal fibers the cranial nerve fibers also descend so that is why most common involvement is the facial nerve upper motor neuron and pseudobulbar involvement so uh, i think cranio sacral outflow starts from the cranial nerve nucleus itself so nuclear or infra nuclear that is the um lower motor neuron that causes the sympathetic and parasympathetic uh, involvement but usually stroke uh, is usually due to involvement of the upper motor neuron cranial nerves i think uh, that is that is why we are not getting uh, any autonomic features uh, because uh, the upper motor neuron fibers or cortico bulbar fibers are involved that is not involved with the autonomic uh, fibers are not associated cortico bulbar fibers of the cranial nerves are not associated with any sympathetic or parasympathetic um, uh, fibers okay so one more question please suggest on guidelines regarding giving thrombolytic therapy duration in case of stroke victim uh, actually the uh, there are two types of uh, thrombolytic therapy one is intravenous thrombolytic therapy another is intra arterial thrombolytic therapy now the the previous guidelines was uh, four and uh, half hours so that is the golden period so now they have extended some um, I, exactly i don't remember um, so i will verify also you verify but the but still four and half hours is the golden period for intravenous thrombolytic therapy and uh, <clears throat> uh, but there um, are some variation uh, they have increased uh, the time period time limit exactly sorry i can't uh, tell the now what is the guidelines exact guidelines because we are not doing thrombolytic therapy in um, scv ave uh, be guidelines kete achi amara thrombolytic ra na ebe kon body 4.5 percent se se achi na Mm -hmm. So I asked our MDM student. They are telling that it is 4.5 hours. So uh, one more question again: Does anterospinal artery involvement or the level of its origin causes uh, medial medullary syndrome? Anterospinal artery uh, at its uh, origin. Yes, causes medial medullary syndrome. Oh yes, involvement of the anterospinal artery causes medial medullary syndrome. No, like that. No, medullary. Ah. Uh. Now, how stroke is related to spinal cord injury? What is it? I am asking my DM students who are the final year. Exactly, I am not clear. Ah, huh? ah. Now, spinal cord injury is related to stroke. No, no. Okay, no, no, no. Okay, sir. Man, another question. Ah. Second part of ah. the question is the level of involvement and transfusion artery responsible for UMN and LMN pictures. Whether the level of involvement of anterospinal artery responsible for UMN and LMN pictures? Level of involvement of the anterior spinal artery uh, responsible uh, for either UMN or LMN pictures. Is there any relation to that? Uh, level of involvement and then anterior spinal artery UMN and LMN pictures uh, in case of stroke or spinal cord. No stroke, stroke only. We are discussing a stroke. Then no, no, stroke, stroke is always uh, upper motor neuron. So level uh, that uh, does not depend upon the level of involvement, uh, because uh, what findings we will get that will hemiplegia. Suppose there is a hemiplegia, so that is upper motor neuron. Other signs are for uh, ataxia, so that is not um, uh, <coughs> hemi anesthesia. That is involvement of the sensory tracts. And hemiplegia or opposite hemiplegia. So that is always hemiplegia means involvement of the pyramidal tract. So pyramidal tract is always upper motor neuron. So below yeah. anterior horn cell, it is always lower motor neuron. Anterior horn cell or downwards, it is the lower motor neuron. Okay, thank you, sir. Uh, probably no more question. We can wind up now. Thank you very much, sir, joining with us. and hopefully we'll uh, get more classes from your department in mm -hmm. near future oil we'll of dementia dementia cognition and stroke we'll next uh, we'll discuss about cognition and stroke okay thank you very much sir thank you all participants for okay. joining this webinar and uh, uh, thank you thank you everybody good night sir okay okay good night